So what what's what was what, how did we get started on the pipeline? Well, we definitely uh, are standing on the shoulders of greats and really learning from past efforts when it comes to how do you produce a pipeline for uh, space or ground-based data. And that's previous missions like Hubble, Spitzer, Herschel, etc. Also ground-based observatories and instruments. This has been especially important for the IFU, chronography, and MOS modes. Um, while they, some of these have been, um, have been done in space already, mo a lot of the work has been done on the ground, and so we wanted to learn from that. And I want to say that we, we're learning what to do in a pipeline and what also not to do. Um, and so it's kind of really learning the, the, the do's and don'ts. So what's the philosophy of the pipeline for JWST? The idea here is to base the algorithms for our pipeline on the community best. And that means we took input from instrument teams and mode-specific teams and really critically reviewed it and tried to come up with what we thought was the best one. The overall goal, goal is really the best justified algorithms produce the best data. Um, we're also given that we're doing five instruments at once, and there's a lot of commonality between the instruments, both in detectors and observing modes. We want to use the same code uh, uh, for different instruments where possible. It makes it much easier to maintain, and this really takes advantage of the strengths of, of the different teams. Different teams have different strengths, and so we can actually um, use that uh, best for the whole mission. And the Pipeline is actually provided directly to the community. Um, it's already there. You, it's on GitHub. You, that's where it is developed. It's not like there is private development that then is pushed publicly. That's everything. You can see all the all the, the nuts and bolts. So the development plan to make it uh, manageable, we split it into kind of two phases. Might be the way to look at it. First is the uh, baseline pipeline, and this idea was well, we need to get something uh, for all instruments in all modes by launch. And we want to provide good science for all instruments and all modes. It doesn't mean it's the optimal uh, data that, for the science, but we want to support um, as, as much as we can. Of course, we had requirements, so we needed to meet the requirements on, our, on the pipeline. Um, I'd say that all the algorithms are basically defined. Most of them are all implemented. There's just a bit more implementation. It's still in the finishing stage of implementing all the different algorithms. Um, so the enhanced pipeline is what we then move to once we've got the baseline all done. We'll move to the next phase, which is we try to get the best possible reductions in a pipeline environment. And this is something that we will um, never really achieve. This is an asymptotic thing that you work on, as I said, the final goal launch plus many years. And you want to provide the highest quality science data we can. And it's really, we're starting, we've already kind of started it uh, to define what the algorithms could be, and we're going to go forever and we'll really work to prioritize the effort because um, in general this is a never-ending process of trying to improve the data the data reduction um, so user experience the pipeline automatically runs on all data um, so the default parameters there's default parameters for all the pipeline steps all the data you know all the data goes through the pipeline within a couple of days of it hitting the ground and goes into the archive so pipeline products are produced and archived final as well as raw and intermediate products, um, things that we think that are interesting for the community. And you can download and run the pipeline locally. That means you can change the defaults. You can add your own customized reduction steps. Um, you might have to have an internet connection to get some of the information, but in general, it's all there for you. So what's the difference between the pipeline and data analysis tools? Um, there'll be a webinar on data analysis tools next, right? So. The pipeline, as I already said, it runs automatically on all the data and doesn't require human interaction. And so that's so we can actually process all the data and keep up with it in real time. Um, data analysis tools in general, they require science decisions, hence human interaction. Um, and that's where you know something more about the data than maybe an automated system could, and you can, you can tweak an algorithm or tweak a parameter. And this is you, most of the data analysis tools are based on pipeline products. And of course, there's overlaps between parts of the pipeline and, um, and data analysis tools. You can imagine parts of especially where you're processing multiple exposures together to say make a mosaic. There might be an interactive stage where you make decisions based on what you see in the data and change the to non-default options. So here's an overview of the pipeline structure. Um, we get data from JWST, it runs through three stages. And, come, and then lots of things get put into the archive, both at the end of the, th the three stages as well as at, at each stage. And so the first stage works on detector artifacts and tries to um, 
remove them and correct for them. The second stage, we start to split into the different kinds of observations, imaging versus spectroscopy, and you do different kinds of processing based on that the, the type of data. And the third stage, and that's so that's still on the individual exposures. And the third stage, we go to where we're we were taking groups of or ensembles of exposures and processing them to higher level products. And this is where you can see that actually the the splitting gets even more uh, specific by observational mode. And this is where you know you make a mosaic, you do a source catalog, you extract spectra from uh, um, um, an IFU cube made of many exposures, things like that. No, one thing I want to emphasize is this is uh, one of the things we're trying differently, which is this is not by instrument. We don't have different pipelines for each instrument, and it, uh, because it turned out that there's a lot more, com there's a lot of commonality, and so we took advantage of that to avoid a lot of parallel development. How do we decide on the algorithms? Um, as I said, the middle bit here is is maybe one of the differences that JWST is where is trying out, which is a Critical review, a single decision point for all the instruments, which is called the calibration working group. And the idea here is that we take all the proposed algorithms, both from the instrument teams and also from three um, observing mode working groups. These were uh, observing modes that it was realized that we wanted to um, assemble all the expertise in one place from the instrument teams as well as the community because they were uh, areas where we needed more input. And this is chronography, time series observations, which is what supports exoplanet transients, for example, and moving targets. And so we got all these algorithms in, and there could be multiple from different instrument teams or different groups, and think about them and ask critical decisions and make a decision on what we thought, using the broad expertise of the entire JWST project to come up with the best solution for each step in the pipeline. And then once we made those decisions, then it goes into the implementation phase, which is the data management systems working group, which Alicia leads, and the science instrument calibration software branch. Um, and so that's the differences between implementation details and testing, and then coding and doing the interface to the data management system, that big automated system that runs everything. So just to here, so here's what the first stage of the pipeline looks like. So all the data goes through detector one. This is where we're going from the raw data you get down, and I'll show you what the raw data looks like in a moment. It's a ramp, right? This is a, the near and mid-infrared detectors mean we can non-destructively sense how many electrons is in a pixel. And so all of them go through this stage, and you can kind of see the, the kind of cyan gives you the, what the steps are. And notice there's both steps that are in common between all the instruments, like jump detection. And there are steps that are, for example, only for the mid-infrared, this first frame and last frame correction. Again, the so the near-infrared detectors all share the same uh, detector technology, and the mid-infrared instrument, MIRI, has, its, has a separate detector type. And so you can actually see this also shows you which instruments uh, use which of the steps, as well as, in this case, TSO, the, there is a slightly different processing for the time series observations, because their goal is relative measurements, not absolute. And you can see the inputs are, you know, the inputs and outputs on all these there. I have there are flowcharts like this, or graphics like this, for all the different uh, named stages in the pipeline, named bits. So a bit about uh, JWST measurements. So if you're, um, you may, you may, not everyone may be familiar with near and mid infrared detectors and how they actually operate, in the sense that uh, these detectors aren't like CCDs. You can actually sense how many electrons are in each pixel without destroying the electrons like a CCD would. So you can make a non-destructive read, is what it's called. You can make a non-destructive measurement. And in fact, you can do this at a regular cadence. And you can then build up a measurement as a function of time that just goes up like a ramp, right? You linearly go up as the number of photons, the rate at which you detect photons uh, is constant usually. So the total number of photons goes up. And so you get this ramp that goes up. And then you may do a reset and then restart the ramp. And you can do multiple integrations in a single exposure. So that's one of the nice things, and there are various things on board JWST that result in averaging the frames together to make groups to save on data rate. So there are things, there are a couple of things that that, that implications of what you can do there. For example, if you get a cosmic ray hit in the middle of your ramp, it doesn't actually corrupt the entire, uh, that the measurement of that entire pixel. What it does in a ramp is it actually deposits charge at a certain time, and that provides, that makes a jump in the ramp. 
So a step function is then inserted into your linear ramp. And so now you actually can, and you can come up with algorithms that would detect that and then tell you that what you, when you want to make your measurement and the basic measurement, which I didn't say, if there's near and bitter Fred detectors is the rate. It is actually a slope, a linear fit to the ramp. And so you get a DN per second as your, as your basic measurement we get out of these detectors. So as you can see in the case for a cosmic ray, if you can detect where that jump happened, you can fit ramps, fit lines before and after it, average the two together, and therefore you've recovered the most of the signal in that pixel, even though you had a cosmic ray. And a very similar thing can happen for saturation. Saturation happens at, an ab, at a particular DN level, usually. And so you can then detect when your measurements, your groups have become saturated and only use the data prior to that, therefore for you know, uh, recovering from saturation and getting the most information you can. This also means you have quite a uh, nice large dynamic range from these detectors. That's just a couple of things you can do. There are many other things. As you can see, there were many steps in Cal, in Cal Detector 1, which is all ramps and the final step. One of the final steps is then fitting a slope. So just to show what it looks like um, for imaging, um, so here's image two, so it's stage two when we're processing still an individual exposure. You add your WCS information, you flat field, you apply your flux calibration, that kind of thing. And you can see how different instruments uh, use information or not, use the, do the steps or not. And then in image three, this is the stage three, this is when you're making what might be called your higher level data products, where now you're going to combine data together from multiple exposures and make you know, do extra outlier detection, find anything that snuck through at the ramp stage, combine the images into a mosaic, make a source catalog, all that good stuff. Um, and so you get calibrated slope images in, and out of that you get your mosaics and your source catalog. One thing I want to emphasize here is one of the things we've learned from previous missions is that we should include moving targets as part of the basic in the, in the beginning of the pipeline so that all that moving target science in the solar system is supported just like everything else. And so we'll be able to make mosaics of moving targets, extract spectra, everything like that. Um, so that's it, the imaging. The spectroscopy is a, um, a little more complex. There's a little more set of steps um, and there's a little more specific, specificity between different instrument modes here. Say for spectroscopy, spec two, where we're dealing with still the individual exposures and spec three, where we start combining things into you know, uh, multi-exposure uh, IFU cubes or uh, co-adding slit spectra together to get the best and highest signal noise detections. And finally, just a, one example of what the data products that will come out of the pipeline. You not only get uh, an individual image, right? So each image that's kind of over there on the on the left, but also then you get your ensemble. You get a whole set of them, twelve in this in this in this case, and these will you'll get all the exposures calibrated exposures with your WCS, all that information about positions. Um, and then you'll also get a mosaic, right? So a combined uh, mosaic um, that you might be able to improve by doing again, but it might not be that bad to start with out of the actual pipeline. And finally, here's some, there's more information. Alicia already put it up. Here's just yet again, emphasizing where to find more information.